And it wasn't just the production line that stopped. Test drivers may have been all over the world, but the imp never sat in a traffic jam on a high street. The, the cars just went flat out for several hours and then back again to the base, whereas the person buying the car for themselves would simply have gone out shopping in it and just done a few miles, maybe got the car half warm and then gone home in it. And that led to, I think, a lot of the overheating problems with distortion in the cylinder head and cylinder block. I would say the car wasn't properly tested before it was released to the public. Um, Prince Philip was opening the factory and really the car wasn't really fully tested to go out on the road before the launch. If they'd given them another five, six months, all these uh, modern features that were new on the imp at the time, they could have been fully developed and I don't think we would have had many problems at all. In fact, it would have been a world beater. Not according to the press. Six months after the launch, Motoring Witch described 10,000 painful miles in a brand new imp. It would perhaps have been naive of us to have expected trouble-free service from a car of new design made in a new factory. And we certainly didn't get it in the first 6,000 miles, having to replace two gearboxes and most of the throttle linkage. We wish we could be more enthusiastic about the immediate prospects for its reliability. But, you know, for all the brickbats, it was a decent little driver. It would hum along at 70 to 80 miles an hour. It had a posh interior, horizontal speedo, jaunty little indicator stalks. And as for that much maligned lump of aluminium in the back, well, that even had a racing heritage. It could trace its lineage all the way back to the Lotus Elite and Coventry Climax. All in all, it felt sporty, expensive and upmarket. It was, after all, a Hillman. Despite a modest 875cc, in the right hands, the imp was a nice little mover. So Roots enlisted the help of a Dublin dress designer, Rosemary Smith, and sent the pair off for a spot of rallying. A win in the 65 Tulip did both their reputations a power of good. Things were looking up. There were quite a few um, all-women's crews in those days, but there were very few, and Norman Garrett saw this, there were very few six foot tall, very young, very slight, sort of modly looking blondes driving cars. And that's why he took me on originally. He thought this would be great for publicity, which it transpired it was. But uh, he actually hadn't reckoned on the fact that maybe I could drive also. When we were at the top coming down, we could just virtually pass anything because it was so nippy and so manageable. It, it was very, you know, sure-footed. But when you got to the bottom and you had to start going up the far side again, because straight away, the lack of part, that's when it came in. And you were just there and you go chug, 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 chug. No Saturday afternoon on the telly was complete without a posse of racing imps. The car's finest hour came in 1970, when George Bevan and driver Bill McGovern won the British Saloon Car Championship in a 315-pound homemade racer. And they did it again in 71 and 72. But no amount of laurels or trophies could galvanise flagging sails. Sporting fastback versions like the chamois and stiletto seemed camp compared to the butch all-conquering Mini Cooper. As for the husky estate, well, it looked just like a hearse. There was even a dinky little van, which in a perfect world should have sold very well indeed, but it didn't. The fleet market had heard all those stories of unreliability, so they just went out and bought minivans instead. Roots got very, very close to signing a deal with the GPO, who had several on test, but they came back shaking their heads as well and pronounced it far, far too fast for all those lead-footed postmen. In 1967, American car giant Chrysler took over Roots and threw some badly needed dollars into a heavyweight advertising campaign. Could they make the imp glamorous? Cry tomorrow, who's to say? Well, I'd, I'd seen it uh, at, the, at the motor show and uh, I fell in love with the fact that it was so compact. It was a ladies' car, definitely a ladies' car. And, uh, uh, and then having done a test drive, it, if you needed to get out of trouble, it, it, you put your foot down and it really, really zapped. I had a beautiful Afghan hound called Albert 
and they uh, they were very enthusiastic about putting um, a hatchback, make, making some mo modifications, so that Albert could just jump in the back and lie down. The, put, they put the back seats down, and it just became a, a character car for me. And today, it's still a car for characters. The essential secret of driving an imp, I would say, is. Uh, don't drive around London or uh, Dublin, where a major city where people can see you. Keep it private and to yourself. But it wasn't long before Chrysler found the Roots Empire was a cauldron of industrial unrest. Workers spent more time off the production line than on. Not only was the imp struggling, so were the Hunter, Avenger and Alpine too. By the 70s, the imp had lost that rarefied special feel and become cheap and tacky. Chrysler's accountants were always meddling, and at one stage they even considered removing the rubber grommet underneath the windscreen washer nozzle to save, wait for it, a quarter of a P. In a desperate bid to shift the last few cars, they came up with a special edition, the Caledonian. And that was simply a question of taking every possible optional extra they could find in the parts bin and throwing it on the car. So you had door mirrors, you had a heated rear window, hideous plaid upholstery, and the unkindest cut of all, a Chrysler push-button radio. None of it did any good at all. And by 1976, they pulled the plug. The imp was dead. Eighteen years after it opened, the computerised car plant was left to the bulldozers. With the closing of the factory, of course, the Hillman Imp was dead, the factory was finished, and there were thousands of people out of work, and to this day are still out of work. Government meddling and corporate bungling had killed Scotland's car industry, but there are plenty of people who still cherish its most memorable product. She's just so old and just needs looking after and I don't look after as well as I should do but uh, she's all mine. It had something you know it was a it was a groover. <laughs> it has a lot of history has its own feel to it and um, I just loved it you know what I mean it's fun. They're just great little cars I like them. The the story of the Hillman Imp is one of complete and utter tragedy. Car makers only get one chance. The Imp was a good idea, but the dice were loaded against it from the start. The public never forgive or forget unreliability, and the 60s motor trade were far happier tinkering with their Morris Miners than this newfangled Scottish upstart. By the mid-70s, the game was over for both the British motor industry and the Hillman Imp. Another car's the star in two weeks here on BBC Two and there's more motoring on the way with an exciting first day from the Rally of Great Britain. The Top Gear Report is next. <laughs>